Welcome back to my wardrobe. In lockdown, how's your lockdown going? It's been horrible for a lot of people. But there is opportunity in lockdown. Have you found one? I have. I've stayed at home and been recording audiobooks, which has really started to pay off. I've got a lot of work on and decent money too, so if it hadn't been for lockdown, I wouldn't have tried that. There's a movie out that uses lockdown as kind of its theme, and it's terrific. It's on Shudder, and it's called Host. And one of the stars of it is Gemma Moore, who is a hot British actress at the moment. She's been, she's also a producer. I mean, I, and I don't know, can, can you use the word actress anymore? Or is it actor? I know when I was talking to her, I, um, I used the word actress and I wondered if I'd done the wrong thing. But anyway, it's in there now. I've recorded it. She's great. She's doing so much, uh, making a difference in the industry. She was in this movie, Doom Annihilation, which was awkward because she was great in it. But the film, the film, not for me. But it's a great performance from her. Anyway, so I had a chat with her, and we do cover off all kinds of things and spend quite a bit of the beginning of it talking about this movie, Host. Uh, we do give a little bit away if you if you don't want to have it. We don't give a lot away, but a little bit. In fact, at one stage, she puts her hand over her mouth when she realizes she's given a bit away. That was her, not me. But yeah, great having a chat with her. Real positive vibe about her too. She's a she's a go-getter. She's a doer, and she's doing lots of things, lockdown or not. And I think this movie, as I said to her in the chat could be the movie of lockdown. So yeah, good to talk to her. This is my guest. The actress or actor. I don't know. Hope I didn't get that wrong. Gemma Moore. Hey Gemma, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm so sorry. Well, I was in another interview and it was running over. Hey, well, that's because you're in the hottest movie at the moment, so you're in demand. These things happen, and then when they get you, they don't want to let you go. I know. It was fun. It was fun. I was like, and then uh, there's uh, obviously because we're all at home, we had some neighbours come, and they were like, oh, they're going to sand the floors outside. I was like, no, <laughs> stop. <laughs> How are you? I'm okay. Are they going to sand the floors? Then are we going to hear floor sanding as we go through this? Well... I was because I was going to link up my mic and then I was like that's a really sensitive mic and I was like I think that'll make it worse but I don't know I, I th they're apparently they're out there now so I think we press ahead and hope okay that, okay uh, yeah that's fine yeah, should be okay so we should start with host because this thing well it's a great film but it's it's cutting edge I don't want to give too much away uh, and but it's getting things like the New York Times are writing about it. it. It's getting a lot of it's getting a lot of heat, if that's the right expression. Is that a movie expression? A lot of heat? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Um, um, it, so for those who haven't seen it, it's basically a horror film that takes place on Zoom, a séance, and it's a bit creepy now because this is exactly what it looks like. <laughs> You are on the set of the hot movie of the moment, but that happens to be where you live because everybody in the movie was literally in their home. So tell me how this thing all started and, and what made it work. So, um, yeah, is I do walk around the house now, like if I'm on my own and I'm like, please don't anything move. Just, just everything stay exactly where you are. <laughs> Um, cause I'm a wimp in real life. Um, so it started with, we have a group of friends and we're all filmmakers. Um, Rob and Jed are about to do a, a film with Sam Raimi. Um, and we all chat, um, and we do a film quiz every, uh, Wednesday. And then we just basically have like Netflix parties. So one day. Um, and you do your film quiz on Zoom? Yeah, we do our film quiz on Zoom. Um, it's a really good one. It's the Prince Charles Cinema Filmageddon. 
Um, and they just did a podcast about us, which was really nice. And we were like, dudes, we're Swayze's babies. We're like, we're always on your, <laughs> on your quiz. Um, so we, one day Jed was like, Gemma, please can you come on Zoom? And I was like, Jed, my car's just been vandalized. I've got blister blasters on my spots. No. <laughs> and then he was like, but everybody really wants to see you specifically and we all love you. And I was like, oh, okay, then yeah, sure, right, I'll come on. And so I went on the chat um, and then Rob's like, I'm just gonna, there's a noise in my attic. I'm just gonna go and explore it. And I was like, don't do that, mate. That's where all things go wrong and you're on your own and you know, don't. And anyway, he goes up and as he goes up, he cuts it with a clip from Rec, I think it is. And then he goes round and it like goes round the, um, the attic and then it gets this point and this goblin just jumps out and then it cuts to Rob falling off the ladder and then just being like dead on the floor. And in my mind, I went, okay, Trump's president, uh, Brexit's happened and- uh, we're, like, we're in lockdown. <laughs> yeah, there's a pandemic. I was like, next logical step, goblins are real. Okay, goblins are real. That's it, fine, okay. And, uh, and so I was like, to start with like smiling because my bad default when I get scared is to laugh. And then after a while I was like, oh my God, is he actually dead? And then just at the moment I was like, okay guys, I'm gonna call the police. Then everyone's like, surprise. And so that video went viral. Right. Um, and then it got the interest of Shudder. And then the boys were like, do you wanna come on another Zoom chat? We have something to tell you. And all of us girls were like, no. Um, but then they managed to get us all on and they were like, we wanna make a film. We wanna do this seance. Do you wanna come and do a seance with us with a real medium next week and just to start the ball rolling? So, um, so the, the film, for those who haven't seen it, it is a seance on Zoom. Are you telling me you actually had a real Zoom seance as prep for this? Yes, and also there might be another Zoom seance going on soon. That's like maybe in the works. Um, much to my heart, I don't know if my heart can take it anymore. I'm quite honest with you, but um, we did it with a real lady, and things that happened in the film actually happened in the zoo in the Zoom seance that we did the real one. So a book fell off my shelf, and I scream and jump up, but I'm a wimp, so I just start crying and then come back to and everyone changes the tone and they're like okay we'll just end it now we'll end it like and then we started to close it and the medium's internet cut off in real life so you're by proxy now part of a real seance because we never closed that one um which is what happens in the film too but with um quite um well it's a horror film like i don't want to give too much away but horrible things happen exactly so then from then it just started rolling and it was two weeks of non-stop filming non-stop stunts non-stop just changing stuff now, going now with the stunts because you're on your own in your place how did you manage to, did the stunt crew come round and set things up yes yeah, so we had lucky 13 action uh who is nathaniel martin and matt uh matt's sort of like uh, stunt company and they are incredible and what they did is they had people so they first of all we had a stunt house so there was like a whole house of stunt team so a lot of the stunts are actually real sneaky cuts that go to the stunt house so they were working together doing stunts and that's a replica of your home uh pretty pretty much well i i did my own stunt oh which, i see right um, right a bit in the film I went to give away and what happened was is I went to somebody's house and uh, I basically the doors were all open and I just walked in and my friend was in her bedroom texting me and I'm just texting her being like okay so where's this and where's this in your house as I walk in there's just a laptop on the table with my friends on the laptop, Rob and Doug, Doug uh, Douglas Cox, the producer, and Rob Savage. And they're like, hey, Gemma. So I just walk into this empty space. They're there and they're like, okay, so you're gonna do this, this, and this. Then Nathaniel Martin comes in full PPE. Um, and he, he's the only one. So we're constantly two meters apart and he's explaining how this is gonna work and this move's gonna work and what's gonna happen. And, uh, and so I'm, basically being directed from afar and then everything else was sort of my responsibility and there's a paramedic outside just waiting on his own in the car um so it was all there was like the safety of that but it was a lot of our own responsibility to do yeah and you used all your real first names in the film 
Yes, we do. Now, as an actor, did that make things easier or more difficult because you got to respond to the character, but you you might be responding to the person you know? Because I'm guessing you you had all met beforehand. Yeah, we we all knew each other as you knew friends each other. on like different sort of levels, but so so using the real your friend's name, but they are but you've got to react to them as the character. Was that easier or harder? I think that once we got over the initial part of it being our names, because I was like, my character can be a bit of a douchebag. So I was like, well, you it's your fault that the whole thing goes horribly wrong. You start it all off. You're responsible for this. I'm not responsible for anything. It's Haley's fault. I just wanted to have fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, so I think on that quick, when we were doing quick responses, because we had a script that um, was a guideline and then we improvised a lot of it. So being able to use each other's names allowed us for that quick improvisation of lines. Um, so I, I don't know, I think once we got over the initial first bit and I was like, okay guys, I don't wanna say anything on this and people are gonna be like, cause already people are like, <laughs> there's a hashtag called justice for Gemma. Because people <laughs> believe that I'm not to blame. <laughs> so <laughs> there's like memes coming out with my name on it, which is <laughs> funny. And it's like a photo of Caroline and then it'd be like, when Gemma messes everything up and then there's Caroline being like, okay, I'll die then. <laughs> Because Ooh. for a lot, a lot of actors, sure, that's okay. For a lot of actors, a lot of actors, they like to hide behind a character. That's you know, as a human being, why they became actors. Mm. But to use your first name was it, it was not an issue. I mean, no, because it's so. I mean, the stuff that happens. If I was, if the, if people really believe that, then fake news would be like. <laughs> I mean, it is going strong, but like, you know, fake, fake news, like, well, I mean, that's why fake news is believed, but I think that if anyone believes that, I'd be worried. Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe that. If not, there it is, so it is great. It's not just because it's, uh, it, it, I mean, the timing is perfect. It's, it's a lockdown. It's going to be the film of lockdown. Whatever happens, it's going to be the film of lockdown. But it does play into what the best horror movies play into, like that fear of the unknown. Like Jaws, you don't know what's beneath the waves. And Psycho, when you're in a shower, you, you can't hear or see properly. And this, when you're on Zoom, you don't know what's behind you. Now, I'm, I've got a wall, so I'm okay. But anything can happen there. You know, I mean, it's the, it is that fear of the unknown that it taps in that thing that you can't see but could be there and uh, and, and i really like that about it you've and, got and a it, curtain. you've got, got a what you've got a curtain to your right not a curtain yeah well, that's right yeah so yeah well this is actually i've got the door open because it's quite warm today so i've got the window open but normally i have this this is my wardrobe and there's a sliding door here that i normally have closed but because it's warm today so yeah you're right something could attack yeah. me from the side you, there's a really scary thing if you go out this Like, if you see someone look to the side on their profile, right? it freaks me out now because I'm like, because as a viewer, you're like, what's, it's like when a cat stares at a wall and you're like, what's there? Yeah. yeah like, what are you looking at? Stop it. <laughs> and it's, this has come at a great time in your career because it's fair to say you are a rising star right now. I've seen, you know, things you've been in. Uh, what was the thing I watched the other night? Y you... You stole it, actually, because uh, all right, it was the Doom Annihilation film. Oh, yeah. Which the, the film itself, you should have been the lead. Who, who played the lead in that? They should have switched those roles around because your bit, the bits you did were perfect. And the rest of the film, it, it, for me, for me, did not live up to Gemma Moore's performance. I thought you deserved to be in a better vehicle there, Gemma. I thought, but... You know, my big disappointment was, uh, and uh, this is a spoiler, um, you you did actually die way too early for me. I think it was about 45 minutes in, so maybe about halfway in. Did did you know that going in that you're only going to get half a film here? <laughs> yeah, I did. You did? You <laughs> did. I was like, well, there's a whole theory, isn't there? There's a film theory that if you see a, someone die, you want to see more of them. So <laughs> I was like, great. Let's just keep killing me, killing me off. <laughs> Have you died in other stuff? Um, yeah, I died in a film called Dragon Kingdom. 
a film called Dra Dra Dragon Kingdom. So, and most things I um, seem to, without spoiling, die in. There was a TV series. I haven't died in that. That would be a bit brutal for the for the channel that it was on. But, <laughs> but yeah, but Doom, Doom was really fun. You know what? Doom was so much fun to film. There was. I remember the first day on set that I turned up actually. First of all, I'd managed to eat like raw chicken before I'd met anyone. And so I introduced myself being like, hi, I'm Gemma. Yeah, I've just eaten raw chicken um, in a sandwich. <laughs> and so like, and everyone was like, oh, no, nice to meet you. And then whisked away and given like an old AK-47 that was decked out in all this like space gear and being like, yeah, you're just gonna walk around and, and uh, shoot this gun, which has like, uh, blanks in it but the blanks come out of like the heat that comes out of them goes about a meter from them so I'm just like I've eaten raw chicken bang 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 <laughs> walking around <laughs> I don't know who decided to give me that but and then and then going in and I and doing stunts and uh, uh, Amma who uh, does the hobby cars with me I'm a Chadda Patel he actually had like jeans on and pink socks so between like that's how we met and we just like the friendship was there because I was like lol I've eaten real chicken. You've got like mixed socks, coloured socks, and when we're running around, with, like bumping into cardboard boxes, pretending we're in the military. Whereas if you met me and Emma, you'd be like, never let them be in the military because they're useless. And where was that one filmed? That was in Bulgaria, um, which was really cool. Bulgaria is a beautiful country. Why did they film it in Bulgaria? It's a science fiction. They could have filmed it anywhere. It's mostly sets. There's no location stuff. Well, the sets in Bulgaria, there's like a whole, there's like a mini Hollywood in Bulgaria. So they've got like old American streets and there's, uh, we, we found them. So we went on like a Zoom, a Zoom, a Doom, from Doom to Zoom, a Doom like chat, like a photo shoot where we were all in costume and we were like in, the, in these like old American streets and there's like a whole like Western village and it's actually a really cool place to film. A lot of films film there. Is that right? There was one bit that looked like it was a, because I'm an, a, I used to be an air conditioning engineer before I got into broadcasting and there's a bit of like, Oh, that's a plant room. They're electric pump. That wasn't, was that some kind of, um, that was, that was an old abandoned factory. Right. Um, and it was like, it was this huge place and there was like packs of wild dogs going around. So I was like, whenever I had to go somewhere, I was like, can someone come with me please? Like with all my guns on, like, I, mean, I really need some help to go to the, like, find the trailers. And so our trailers were like all parked in this place and then we'd walk in and it was actually so hot that day. But yeah, I think it was this old factory that had just been sort of decked out with these really sort of cool space-like air conditioning units apparently <laughs> yeah well there was chilled water pumps in there i know that much and uh so what uh, wonder woman how did you get that because that was done in hollywood wasn't it so no that was done in italy oh in italy right so did you get to go to los angeles i mean you're in a hollywood movie did you get to work in los angeles no i didn't we but so i i missed the premiere because i was in Cannes with my short film that i produced um and it was like between Cat and going to Cannes and going to the premiere of Wonder Woman. And I, was, I assumed that the premiere would go ahead for London. And so I unfortunately didn't get to go to either because everything, there was like a, everything that happened around London Bridge and it got canceled. Um, so I didn't go to LA for Wonder Woman, but we filmed in Italy, like on the Amalfi Coast. And it was, it was beautiful. Like some of the locations for that were, so stunning that I just I went back I just went straight back Matera is where they filmed the new Bond film and I think it's the cultural city it was called the cultural city last year like of the year and it had all the Salvador Dali statues and everything but it's this old city made out of caves so everything's like in these caves and it's sort of like a labyrinth my partner got ill one day and he was supposed to go to the doctor which was like five minutes away and i got a call 45 minutes later being like i'm stuck in this labyrinth it's like midday i've got a fever and i was just like okay babe it's supposed to be five minutes down the road so wonder woman was like italy um but they build sets on beaches and had like huge green screens set up on beaches. And I went to LA afterwards for a different um, job. I was signed to ABC for the year. Um, 
on a contract that I won for their first transatlantic competition in the UK. Um, so so you, 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 you won it? That was a competition? Yeah, so it was like sending a, a self tape. Um, and I'd, I'd where did you get where did you find you're so busy where did you find time to do that well actually I was on a film and I'd injured myself and lost a tooth chewing pineapple with the skin off not with the skin on <laughs> and uh and I was sat at home and I was really like feeling a bit down and I was just like okay so what can I do? My friend was like, there's a self tape competition. You get a year contract with ABC. Why don't you do it? So grumpily with a plant in the background like this, I was, a, I did a self tape and then I got into the second round and then I got into the third round and then I got a call from the head of casting at ABC being like, you've won the competition. Um, so yeah, can you hear them sanding my floors? Oh, a good? little, a little bit, but it's not, it's not too distracting, but it's very, it's very, um, it is, it is, um, it's there, it's present. It's it's very host actually. That's what it is. It's, it's noises. It's yeah. It's the ghost living in my walls, sanding my my floors. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So then, I got to go to LA for that, which was really really cool. Um, and I got to go to Disney, and I watched uh, a Disney film with all the, these Disney animators as well, which was like a dream for me because I think Disney's magical and wonderful. So, but. I was gutted that I didn't go to the premiere for Wonder Woman because that would have been a life, uh, a real, but there'll be many chances. I, I think I was, I got to see Twin Peaks right. two rows behind, um, you know, like the whole everyone. So I just was like, it was pretty amazing. I've actually got it on my wall uh, because I was like obsessed with David Lynch when I was younger and I used to sit in uni and eat Cocoa Pops with cream and watch Twin Peaks and so then when I got to sit behind him and watch him cry at his own thing I was like okay okay it's fine I missed the Wonder Woman premiere this is pretty cool pretty cool um, pretty cool yeah so when I watch a lot of your stuff you've got the most perfect American accent <laughs> thank you how is it done? And I ask for a selfish reason. I um, produce and, and, and narrate a lot of audio books. And when you audition for them, it says what kind of accent they're looking for. And a lot of the ones that say American accent, I think, well, I could probably do one, but I don't know if I could pull it off well enough. And there'll be lots of different American characters. And I skip them and just do the British ones. What is the trick to getting a good American accent down? You could actually make me money here. Okay, so, I mean, I have a, like, American accent cheat sheet above my desk yeah and i think the r's because they're rotated the r's i think are the best thing so i always do peter piper picked a piece of pickled pepper and so that always Peter. right so that's it you've got to get those r's and once you get that everything falls into place after that yeah and there's things like we say tube yeah we say we say tube. Tube. so yeah. it's like slight changes in in words i've been trying to do an asian accent um and i can only say motion sensor save power like that because their r's are like rhotic r's as well and it's so it's so interesting i i'm fascinated by how the human mouth can change so much um and just by like lifting the back of your tongue you can change something also, American obviously is very nasal. Yeah. And then you can sort of change it like that. I, I don't know. It, it was just practice, isn't it? I love, I have to listen to YouTube podcasters and then I get it on a loop on like GarageBand and I just take a little bit and I get it on a loop and then I just repeat and then it loops and then it repeats and loops and repeats and loops. But I think the, the R's are the one, as soon as you get them, yeah. sneak up on you. I'll let you know how I get on. So, yeah. so, so where are you from? Where did you grow up? So I am born in Hong Kong, came over when I was like three or four. When my parents were going to go to New Zealand. Now I kind of wish they did because they handled COVID <laughs> so well. She's amazing. Um, and then mum was like, where am I? There's nothing here. And so England was the, uh, <laughs> the happy medium. So d my dad's from uh, originally from London and my mum's uh, from Hong Kong. And then we went to the countryside and I grew up on a farm, uh, walking pigs and Where uh, about? in Herefordshire, well, kind of, it was sort of Gloucestershire, then Herefordshire and then Shropshire. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. It just went further and further away um, from London. And so I grew up with lots of different animals, lots of green space. And uh, I was up like 5 a.m. every morning mucking out horses and in bed by like seven because I was knackered. And then every weekend I was at uh, horse riding competitions or pig walking competitions sometimes. Um, so so you're a proper country life. girl then, yeah? Yeah. yeah. I've been I trying to grow courgettes, but they're not doing well in London. What's that? Trying to grow some courgettes because I used to grow courgettes every year. Yeah. Outside. And I'm just, the foxes keep stealing them. <laughs> So the acting, the acting bug. When did that bite? Oh, that's been that's been um, a a long a long time. Well, first of all, I used to want to be a tractor until I realised that wasn't logically possible. When I was like mm -hmm. three, I was like, I'm going to be a tractor when I grow up. My mum was like, No. <laughs> and then a cheese taster. Again, my mum was like, Not a viable career, Gemma. Um, little does she know that I go cheese tasting <laughs> once a year. No. Um, and then. I had, uh, what did I have? So yeah, then cheese tasting. And then I used to make my parents watch performances of me. So I've like, since I was very little, um, every, pretty much every single day, I'd be like, I've done a performance. You guys are going to have to watch this. And they're like, okay. <laughs> um, being amazing parents that they are. And then at 12 years old, I went to my second school. And when you said they have to watch them. What did you tape them or did you perform them live kind of thing? Perform them live. Okay, and what kind of things were they? Spice Girls. Uh, okay. <laughs> Spice Girls, renditions of films that I'd watched. Uh, <laughs> my interpretation of a whole film in two minutes. Um, then sometimes it would be that they'd have to come and almost, I basically started the supper club idea when I was a kid. That At what age are we talking here? Like eight years old with mud pies. Okay. I was like, welcome to my supper, supper dining thing. <laughs> No, I didn't do that. I definitely didn't coin that term. <laughs> and um, so they used to come and uh, watch those things. And then I went to school. I got a drama scholarship to school. And I was dyslexic, so I always got really nervous about lines. But actually, once I got a bit more confidence, it just got better and better. And then I went to university and I studied English literature and drama because I love books. And I, and I also the drama that I studied was performance art and I had an incredible sort of set of teachers who taught me there has to be purpose behind, behind performance and there can be purpose behind performance. You're not just doing it as this like narcissistic thing where you were like, look at me, everyone. It's, it's actually, you can have a say in, in what you want people to see and how much you want people to see and what you reveal and what you don't reveal. And, and that can be, a, pol a political thing um and then i went to drama school central the royal central school of speech and drama sorry and from there i got taught how to make films as well um and when i was at uni actually when everyone was doing freshers i was like working five jobs i was working in retail i was working cleaning toilets i was then going to set you know on some days like a week one week i went to set every single day i was filming jack ryan um with kenneth Branagh and then when I went to drama school, I'd kind of already had that under my belt and I actually learned how to make films. And then since then I've been sort of creating and acting at the same time. Yeah, you're very, very busy as a producer. Tell me about stalling it. <gasps> my little baby. It just got into Woods Hole Film Festival. Did um, it? So Car Caroline Ward uh, is the writer and director. She came to me with a script and it was about these women in a toilet discussing how they'd been stalling life. And I went, why don't we set this in the 80s and I was like and why let's make our costumes really big and puffy and our hair big and then makeup tacky and you know put it in this pastel toilet um and then uh I sort of was like let's Sasha's character I was like let's add a nosy neighbor because there's always a nosy neighbor in a toilet if you're having a conversation someone will you know chime in and in, a, in a lady's toilet for sure in a men's toilet, I don't know what the dynamic is. Um, no, it's very, very quiet, yeah. Well, I imagine at a urinals, you wouldn't want someone to chime into a conversation. With it happens, them. but yeah, it's not, there's not, <laughs> there's not, um, there's, there's no movie in it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe there is, maybe there is. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> so was it the, I mean, obviously producing it, it's, it's a business decision, but was there a, a kind of a, 
I don't know, a lust for control? I think more uh, a reaction to our industry. I think when I was younger, I was so fed up of being typecast. I was fed up of not seeing myself. I mean, I cried in the Star Wars when I saw Rose's character because I was like, wow, there is an Asian woman who isn't portrayed in a certain way Mm. that's powerful and smart and funny and got a lot of heart. And so I, I mean, this was way before, but I wanted to, I wanted to see women behind the character. I wanted to see women in front of the character. And then I wanted to see diversity across the board. Like I, I think I started with being very much limited in, in understanding that I wanted women. And then I, and then I realized actually, you know, it just doesn't stop there. There has, there has to be, narratives from every different kind of you know diverse background in order for there actually to be interesting layers i think if someone also being able to not to have a voice so it's not like an echo chamber to have someone to encourage people on a film set i have um whenever i do a film set like a set of rules so everybody has to go on set they don't presume anyone's gender they don't you know they have to have all um consent if anyone wants like if anyone wants to put a mic pack on someone there has to be consent there has to be freedom to be able to ask questions um and have boundaries something is very very, like adamant on everyone being understand that they're allowed to voice those boundaries and voice concerns because i don't want to put anything out that i've silenced anyone on set or someone on set when it comes to creativity obviously i understand that but if it's coming from someone being like, oh, this makes me feel uncomfortable because from my experience in my life that's different from your life, this might hurt somebody of this experience. And then being able to discuss that and being able to say, well, okay, if it's a creative choice, we have to make sure it's a creative choice and it has reason behind it. Going back to the performance art stuff that I learned at university as well and gender politics. I I did a lot of gender politics at uni. And so every film set has these policies that we go on set everyone has to read them everyone has to acknowledge them we do a talk before we start filming and stalling it really had and I did a film called all of me as well that did exceptionally well and won a lot of awards and that a lot of women were at the time uh, identifying as female and now have transitioned and so there was a lot of incredible voices on that set as well and what was what has the reaction been like with uh, did you ever did you did you get much pushback on that So for all of me, when we went to Cannes, it was just before the whole Harvey thing kicked off, actually. The Harvey? Oh, Weinstein, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The Harvey thing, it's been and gone now. (laughs) Um, It's, yeah, so he was, like, it was just before the thing happened. A lot of people were like, why is it only women? Blah, 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 blah. Um, What's the whole thing is like, oh, uh, you know, like we're going to make a men only set. And it's like, do you not understand that that's what it has been? <laughs> so there right. is pushback, but I'm happy to, I'm very privileged in terms of, you know, you know, I have a lot of support in my life. I have a lot of good people around me. So I actually can, when I have the energy, put in the time to not educate people because we'll educate people, but not in a patronizing way to be able to answer questions and try and change well, prejudice comes from ignorance, and it's all about it's all about learning. That's 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 all it is. That's that's how you fix it. Is you make people more aware, and yeah, that's how to do it. You can't yeah. you, you can't just stamp your foot and say no. It goes this way because people will go why. But if you go no no look, how would somebody feel like? Yeah, that's that's it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and 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 being in a in a position where I can do that, I think it's important to do that rather than somebody else. You know who's less not less like fortunate than I am so when I have the emotional energy I will do that to people so actually I was quite happy to sit there and argue with a few trolls here and there and and be like well actually here's your here's your reading list for the next three years yeah go educate yourself yeah no that that is brilliant Gemma that really is making a difference in, in an industry that's well I don't know. I'm not in that game, but it does have a reputation, and you see it on the screen. You see some of the uh, some of the issues, and it does make you uncomfortable that you know there is you know, so much ignorance there. But yeah, that is yeah, watching stuff back now that I used to love when I was younger is 
it's interesting. You pick a few things out and you're like, whoa, <laughs> that wouldn't be allowed now. So it's changing. It's glacial, yeah. but it's changing. Yeah. And you do voiceover work too. Yeah, dude. I mean, I'm assuming you, if you've got a wardrobe. Yeah, I do. I do bits and pieces, not as much as 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 I'd like. Uh, it, it is a it is a game that's hard to get into if you're not an up and coming superstar actress with a hot film. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it is a little bit more difficult for a broken down radio disc jockey to get the same kind of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, voiceovers are a fun. You, when I was done? at radio school, I went to radio school. I lived in Australia. It's where I got into radio. And I got into, I went to the Australian film, TV and radio school afters. I don't know if you heard of it. And um, they took us for a day to 2WS it was. It's, it's now called WSFM. They took us to this radio station out in Western Sydney. And they said, you're going to watch some commercials being recorded. And we met the copywriters and we met the producers and everything. And then they brought in the people who were voicing them. And they were all actors. And I said to them, I said, you use actors like this is a radio station. Haven't you just got loads of people who talk on the radio that can read a script? And they said, no, for commercials, we always use actors because they just do it better because they look at the words and they use everything they've learned through acting and the techniques, whereas radio people and the example I've been given since by a, by a radio consultant called Dan O'Day, and it's an exaggeration. But if you give a, a radio presenter a script and they say to him, right, in this script, you're a duck, okay? The radio presenter will go, quack, quack, where, <laughs> you know, where, whereas an actor will, will, will be a duck, you know? And, and they were great. I mean, seeing them bring, this is just basic 30-second radio commercials, but seeing actors, because there were characters in them and conversations. There was a guy and girls. And, and just to see the way that they did it was actually quite mind-blowing because the thing really came to life off the page. Uh, it, do you have to, when you're doing a voiceover, I know you do straight commercials and you do promos for Killing Eve. That's you on there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, do, do you use every inch of your acting chops to get that across? Or is it just, oh, this is a voiceover. I'm just going to read it. I think it's... um. I definitely go in going like, okay, well, I'm just going to read it how I see it and then and then just take it from there. Uh, a lot of the time I look at something and, and my dyslexic brain goes, ah, and then my <laughs> mouth just starts talking and then they're like, great. And you're like, oh, okay, that worked. Um, but I think the uh, Yak to Yak, who's my agent, who are phenomenal, they, I think the one thing that they said to me is what's similar is you have to take direction learn how to take direction and change and listen and, and change it as you go. And I think acting really helped with voiceovers because you'll have, sometimes you'll have, you know, 10 people in a room, you know, from all different departments have, having a say in it. And like, can you do it a bit more like this? Can you do it like that? And sometimes those directions get very abstract. So you have to be able to be like, okay, I think I understand what you're saying. We're going to take this from there, that from there, and this from there. And then you do it. And then they're like, okay, it's still not right. And also being an actor, you get a lot of rejection and you get a lot of, you have to be like this open book at the same time, having a lot of criticism sometimes thrown at you. So I think being a voiceover, you have to be able to take direction, not get offended by it and just be able to sort of just keep trying different things and experimenting and hope one of those things land. And if it doesn't, not to get frustrated and just to keep, just to keep being like, okay guys, okay, well maybe we need to rethink about how we're, communicating this to each other because i think that's the thing that would stress a lot of people out is when it's not quite hitting the mark which actually happens a lot then to be able to stop take a step back and be like we need to look at this differently obviously something's not there's a communication not happening here or you have something very specific can we maybe find a reference for that let's talk about the podcast then because this is podcast radio and yeah. you're going to be my special guest in it'll be a week on friday your show will be on and we'll cut the audio up from this uh zoom cast this zoom cast will go on youtube but then we'll cut the audio up and that will go uh into your show on podcast radio when when i do the countdown so it's it's the hobby cast so was how, how did this how did this all happen what was the birth of this i mean you've got enough going on it's like, oh yeah, I want, you know, 
I'm producing, and I'm acting, I'm voiceover. I know, I'll do a podcast too. What happened there? I, um, I, do you know what I love? So I was sat in a cafe um, in Wilsdon Green, and I was uh, listening to my music, and this old lady just sat next to me and didn't say anything and just sort of got her food sat next to me and was, like, looking around. And then she kept, like, looking at me, and I was like, you know what, I'm just not going to be a millennial whatever I'm just gonna take my headphones out and I and I just and I just took my headphones out and then she was just like oh um I'm just about to have my breakfast and so she opened the conversation up and then I started talking to her and I was learning about her hobbies and all that she'd been doing and retirement and all these wonderful things and I just came away from that and for weeks after I just felt so amazing and I would tell everyone that you know she liked to sew and she was doing this incredible, making this incredible garden and she made it into the pattern of like, I think her husband's face, but like, it was just like this wonderful story telling that had come from it. And, and podcasts, I don't know, podcasts are, for me fill that gap where I really miss and I got it a lot in the countryside where you can just sit and chat to anyone. Like you'd meet someone with their dog I got a dog because I miss talking to people now. Um, and you can just sit and chat and, and learn about what people do. And something where I always noticed this childlike smile was when people talked about their hobbies. Because it was something where they didn't have to, you know, get any money from it. They weren't doing it for a success thing. It was literally something that made them happy. And they had a sense of achievement from it. And they got to spend time on their own. And it was their own precious thing. And so I just was like, I want to talk to people who have hobbies. And I want to know why they do it. Because you have all this small talk with people at cocktail parties. And you don't never get into the detail of it. And if and I find if I start asking too many questions, people think I'm a bit weird and a bit like, like sort of like why are you interviewing me so then I was like so I'm just going to make an environment where I can interview you um and so I found in the first series uh season which you will be uh playing um I think my doorbell just went you need to check it mind if I answer You're expecting it. a delivery yeah, yeah. okay now this really is like the movie host this is like host. Yeah, because it's 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 the it's it's the, that happens to the um to the medium. It's the first yeah. thing that goes wrong. Yeah. Was there somebody there? Yeah, it was. Um, it was it was somebody that it's all kicking off today. This is the thing about Zoom, isn't it? I mean, Zooming, being in your own home, you have no there's no control over the the things. But we've got sanding, we've got deliveries. Anyway, as I was saying, um. What was I saying? I was you were talking about, about hobbies and meeting people with hobbies and how it's their passion and you wanted to talk to them more about that and that's how the podcast started. Yeah, and as an actor, you do many, you wear many different hats. So I do kickboxing, I play the ukulele, I uh, did yoga, um, I went to a breath workshop that I almost fainted in. Like, So I was just like, I want to talk to people about stuff. And I'd heard about Quidditch and being played the harry potter London. game yes in but they so, fly on broomsticks yeah sadly they don't fly in real life which is <laughs> sad but did you know it's like a world champion game like it's an official sport so what, like, there's like a there's a there's a football association of quidditch kind of thing with rules and regulations and yeah yeah it's huge in america like it's they they have massive tournaments and they have them in Europe and Asia, and there's um, they have them in the UK a lot as well. There's one called the uh, the one that um, I uh, got the pleasure of interviewing John uh, John Morris, and that was uh, from the London Unspeakables, and they play every Sunday I think in Clapham, and they then go and play other teams in UK and have tournaments. 
and it's huge. And the best thing is, is that they get the golden snitch is like a person that wears a, a tennis ball in a sock that tucks it into the back of their shorts and then runs around and you have to pull <laughs> the sock out, <laughs> which I think is amazing. And apparently before, because they change the rules all the time. So before they recently changed the rules that the snitch can only stay within so many like yards of the playing field, the snitch could go everywhere. So the snitch could literally get on a bus and just like go off. So you'd have the seekers like go or, uh, going around trying to like catch them and they'd be like across down the high street and you'd still be playing here. And so, and then you'd have to come back from miles away with this tennis ball and a sock as the like hero that ended the game. So, and, and so me and Um are actually, we're doing, Amma was my guest co-host at the time, Amma Chadha Patel, who is uh, one of the co-hosts on the new season. He was on that with me and we were just, it was great because the more you find out, the more you're like, what, what's going on here? <laughs> like this is, what, how is that even a thing? And for Amma thought it was his real job. <laughs> and he was like, no, I have an actual job. <laughs> So yeah, so that was fun. And Dungeons and Dragons is something I've always wanted to learn about. I've actually got my new dungeon dice. I'll show you, look how fancy these are. These are my, so Dungeons and Dragons, you have like six dice. Yeah. They're glittery and pretty. Right. So I interviewed this incredible Antonia Tutil, who's actually on Twitch because now Twitch is this huge gaming site. That yeah, I didn't know massive. About. Yeah. And, and the, they play on there and then a lot of people play with them. So they have this, you know, a dungeon master and then everyone plays along with them. So it's just incredible thing that I didn't know about. And then I get to interview someone and find out all the details about it and share with all the listeners as well who want to play Dungeons and Dragons. And this is from my point of view asking questions. So I'm a beginner in all of these things. And so hopefully I can be the voice of many people to ask these questions of like, and a lot of them can be very silly questions like, you know, how long does the game go on for? Because a lot of people, I think, get nervous about Dungeons and Dragons going on for years and years and years, but actually you can do it for, you know, three hours and that will be a good game. And you, you know, you make, and I didn't understand if I had to be good at maths because yeah. there were dice and that made me a bit like, so, but now I know that it's, that you can have a calculator like I used to have as a waitress. <laughs> pocket so what's um, the coolest hobby then that you've or hobby the, the person with the coolest hobby that you thought i wish i could do that but it's just too cool i don't think there's been like the coolest i really so emma stannard did uh 80s and 90s toys mm -hmm. collecting um and she brought some of them with her like there was one i think it was a squidgy one where you it's a, a snuggle bum and you shake it and it's and it squeals um so I wish I wish that I could collect 80s and 90s toys, but I think it's something that you, it's a lifetime work because you have to pay things. People pay like hundreds of pounds for those, you know, those little hairbrushes that you would, your mum would hoover up, or someone would hoover up, or the accessories are actually the most expensive things to these old toys. Like my little. We, pony. The weird thing is with them, the ones that people were told were going to be worth a lot of money are not. Like the Beanie None. Babies, people collected them and and kept them in pristine, and they're not worth anything. But other no. stuff that you would never have thought of is worth a fortune. It's strange. You can't predict it. No, like Polly Pockets. Like Polly Pockets are huge for like collections. My Little Pony. Yeah. There's a My Little Pony that's really rare that's pregnant. And when you open its belly, two tiny little My Little Ponies come out. <laughs> Which is so See, cool. that's a horror film right there. That's like Alien meets Black Beauty. I mean, it's right there, ready to go, isn't it? Ready to you go should, you could minute. produce that up. I could. I could do stop motion. I could do, <laughs> like, I mean, that could be my next hobby, stop motion. There's some really good apps for that. Yeah. Um, in the new season, there's some pretty cool, because uh, we are just each bringing our own research. There are some pretty cool... Um, hobbies that come into play like extreme ironing uh there's also there's a haunted house like haunted houses are things huge in america and you can do haunted camping sites so you can choose how long you want to sleep for so if you want to sleep for like two hours the rest of the night that you camp will you will be haunted in some shape or form in this forest or you can sleep half the night or you can just 
experience other people getting haunted and just not get haunted at all. Um, and then there's like this one haunted house as a 40 page waiver. And like they do, they do, it's for like people who like really extreme things. Like there's like teeth pulling and it gets, it's, it's very problematic, but I was like, people enjoy this as an extreme hobby. So we also have like technology. Do you remember Robot Wars? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know that Jeremy Clarkson was the presenter on the first ever series of, of Robot Wars? Was he? Wow. Yeah, and then he almost got decapitated by a bit of metal flying off one of the, one of the Well, there's a lot of people probably wish that that had happened. Um, <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of people that probably wish that would happen. Yeah, it would have um, changed the face of television as we know it. Yeah, it would have. It would have. I'm sure. I'm sure someone would have taken taken. Jeremy yeah, there would have been another off. Jeremy Clarkson ready to take his. Well, I, well, I don't know. We shouldn't really probably speculate on that one. <laughs> and what about you? When you're listening to podcasts, assuming you have time, what do you like to listen to? I love. I got really into like the uh, the Guilty Feminist. I liked it because it was. I don't know that one because it sounds so, and it sounds like it's not aimed at me anyway. I but think I, it, be... I think it would do because it's yeah? like there's um it's Deborah Francis White and she has this thing at the beginning where she goes I'm a feminist but if I could go back in time and save this incredible woman from this situation or go back in time to when Chris Hemsworth was really desperate to kiss someone and didn't know who to kiss probably go to the latter of the two. So it's like this, like, I'm a feminist, but mm -hmm. the other day uh, I used Facetune or like something like that. Like it's it's this wonderful place where you can it, listen to women from all different backgrounds, um, explore their role in the world, but also be like, oh, yeah, I constantly make mistakes or I constantly and am, am failing to live up to this like feminist values or but you know like i'm trying to constantly do better but yeah the other day i definitely did this thing and, and it wasn't a feminist thing like they always go did you have a feminist week or a guilty feminist week i see and that's the, the whole idea of the podcast right oh yeah. actually it sounds quite good now as you now as you say it like that yeah no, and they're all comedians that had like hannah gadsby on they've had uh felicity ward on so it's really funny and like and but they also cry like there's an episode where they go from laughing to then crying because of, from frustration because they're angry they talk about really hard-hitting topics but also accompanied by silliness and so it's this wonderful balance of many different things and then i also love no such thing as a fish yeah always I does well on the podcast chart i mention it every week i need to get those guys on because yeah that's, yeah they're uh... wonderful and and I think it's the same with this hobby thing. I love finding out new random things that you're like, is that, is that? And then you go and Google it because you're like, nah, I don't Those believe things, that. Aren't they the writers on QI? Yes, the QI yeah. elves, they call themselves. I think, <laughs> which is quite sweet and nice. They, Cause they must find some, the, the research. I think it's brilliant that they did it because there must be so much that falls to the wayside. Yeah. That, they they had information that they're like how was other people not knowing about this there was like um what is it there's one episode where they just discuss how the is it the Taj Mahal is basically made out of cake mixture like egg and yeah and top like and and they cut there's some strange there's so many strange things I I got to a habit of starting to write down these facts <laughs> that I could remember them because there's so many of them but they, they're just so weird and wonderful and, and it always makes me smile because it's lighthearted. I like also Fern Cotton's Happy Place. Yeah, that always yeah. does well in the chart, yeah. It's, it's nice to hear people talk about mental health and, and stuff like that, but it can get quite like like heavy sometimes. So then that's why I go to like the comedy or, um, or the Guilty Feminist because it's like silly. What do you like to listen to? I like to listen to a lot of interview podcasts because I'm interested in, in people. I mean, it, you know, I don't read many books now because I've been narrating so many of these audio books. I'm working on five <laughs> at the minute. And um, but when I did read books, I, it tended to be biographies. 
because yeah. I just wanted to see how people tick. For a while there, I went through a phase of I would read biographies written by famous men's wives because I thought they would know them in a way that... So I read um, Cynthia Lennon's book about John Lennon and I wrote Patty Boyd, read Patty Boyd's book, which was about George Harrison and Eric Clapton because she was married to both of them. One of the best was, was uh, Peter Cook, the comedian Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, uh, his yeah. ex-wife. Most of them were ex-wives when they wrote the books as well, which gave them a lot more leeway. So I, so I, always, liked, I always liked to go for... You know, I really like Mark Maron's podcast because he gets, he gets interested. He's just done a wonderful one with Jim Carrey just amazing and uh yeah he did a great one obviously with barack obama which is is the famous one that mark Marin did but i also like uh pen's pen sunday school pen gillette pen and teller the magicians pen gillette who is a uh, a larger than life character and very outspoken um atheist and he likes to uh say what he thinks and 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 that's good so yeah that's kind of what i i like yeah so it's been great talking to you, Gemma. Um, uh, the the film at the I mean, Gemma Moore is everywhere, but the one you must see and see it during lockdown. Don't wait till lockdown's over. You've got to see Host because it is terrific. It's a great film as well as being a lockdown film. It would hold up even if the even if lockdown had been invented for the movie and lockdown wasn't real, it would still work. It's not one of those that's necessarily of its time. It would still work if that were, if this dystopian world we live in had been created just to make that film. It would still work. So make sure, make sure you catch host. Make sure you catch the hobby cast with uh, Gemma Moore. Uh, thanks for talking to me. What are you looking forward to? Firstly, thank you for talking to me. It's been really fun. I've really enjoyed it, and I've been looking at that curtain, being like, something's going to happen. <laughs> um, what am I most looking forward to? What in life or just in anything this week or anything? anything. What is it that's keeping you going? Because I, I maintain and I may be wrong, but I don't care. People keep saying the whole trick to life is living in the moment. And I think the trick to happiness is having something just to look forward to just to keep you going because if, if in the moment maybe maybe you should live in the moment but i'm sorry i can't do it even though i'm enjoying this moment i'm also thinking about how this will be great when it's cut up for the radio and this will be good when it's on youtube and you know i'm looking forward to you know just there's i think you just need to have something just a little bit further ahead and i'm just wondering what it is for you um I think I think I'm looking forward to getting back on a film set. Right. Because so I, you just like the vibe on the set. That's your your natural yeah, habitat. I love, I love stepping into um, anything that like art directors or you know just stepping onto set and into that world because I think I mean Lord of the Rings was the film that made me love films and those magical worlds and. I remember with Doom and in and, and previous films and Wonder Woman, the, that magical moment where you're like, everyone's around you and you're st st stood in, on set and you can chat to people and people are excited too and there's this buzz going on and you're about to, and then the director walks on set. I'm really looking forward to doing that again. And being able to hug people. When I can hug my mum and dad, I miss, my mum just treats her window like a shop window now. I'll go over and she'll be like, do you want this cake? Or do you want some bananas? <laughs> she like produces, she'll, and I'll be like, mum, actually, I really need some of this. And she'll be like, and then go to the back of the house and come back and be like, here you go. And then I can see my mum, my mum's like this really sweet, like um, my friend's got a toddler and apparently um, they've told him that they can't, she, they can't hug him. And the ah. toddler, because Why? grandparents can't hug because you know yeah, cause I think now it's fine but during lockdown my friend was saying it was really funny because the toddler would be like pretend that they were going to get a toy and then run and leg it and just grab one of the grandparents legs and my mum has that tendency I can see her being like Mm, like wanting to hug so now that's why I've been like mum you have to stay in the house behind the window and then she'll shut the window and I'll go up to the window and collect my stuff but I've only done that twice because my dad's high risk so I've so I can't wait until I can just hug my mum and dad I think that's something I'm really looking forward to doing that and being on a film set with a load of creative creative heads well let's hope you don't have to wait too long to enjoy those things 
Jill yeah. Moore, thank you very much for being on the Zoomcast and also thank on you. Podcast Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Graham. Have a lovely day. Day. Was that good for you? Yeah, that was really fun. Thank Great. you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. And for being on so long as well. So many so many people are, are pushed for time and I know you are because whatever. But I really do appreciate your time. Thank you so much and best of luck with everything. What's that? Sorry again for being late as well. Oh yeah, hey, these these things happen. Hey, look, it's 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 lockdown. We've nowhere to go anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope to hear you on an audiobook sometime. I'm a big fan of audiobooks. Are you? I've just done a, I've just done one that's just gone for sale this week. It's a, it's called Spitfire Final Flight. It's a nice story. Make a great movie too. It's about I didn't it, it, the guy that wrote it. I'll tell you what it's about. It's about yeah. they find these they they find that there's rumor that there are these pristine brand new Spitfires were buried in the Burmese jungle in the 1940s and they're apparently still there. So this American millionaire says he wants one, but he needs an expert Spitfire expert you know so they go and break this old guy who's 99 years old they break him out of a an old folks home where he's living a miserable life but he's an ex-spitfire pilot and raf test pilot and they break him out to be their like technical advisor but he's got alzheimer's and it comes and goes and it's wow. like and they, and they go to burma to nick this spitfire it's a great story it's called spitfire final flight so yeah that's it, a really good story that's yeah. it's almost like um like a uh, what's the, the the it's kind of like I imagine it Cornetto trilogy that kind of vibe. yeah mixed, yeah but also mixed with um, Indiana Jones yeah like said, so I can imagine that the meld of those two things yeah and there's a real generational thing there too you know because he's an older guy and he's got this very young carer and she realizes what a life he had before he was in this miserable old folks home where they you know took down to you and whatever and now he gets to be a go and be a hero again you know and it's so it's really cool and he has to um don't want to give too much away but he yeah, has to land a spitfire on a ship that isn't an aircraft carrier they just put plyboard on a freighter and he's got to land it on. i mean it's great it's great wow <laughs> what well, the guy that has alzheimer's has to land it yeah <gasps> yeah yeah, it wasn't planned that way, but their original drug-running South American pilot gets arrested, and now they need a pilot, and he's all they got. You know, it's so good. Oh, that's so good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that reader. I'll give that to my dad as well. Cause Spitfire be... Final Flight, it's called. Yeah. Spitfire Final Flight. Yeah. Okay. The, the audio books on Audible, and the, it's based on an actual book, which is somewhere which would be a good read too. But yeah. Oh, amazing. Okay, I'll definitely check that out. Thank you so much, Gemma. Thank you. And take care. Have a nice day. See, you, talk to you next time. Next time there's another big hit movie out, we'll have another chat. Definitely. Okay. Um, See you. Bye-bye. Bye.